Okay, everybody, here we are. Welcome to uh, the Astro Babble. Um, my name is Sam, and I am actually very excited this morning because I am on the verge of a major breakthrough with the technology. Um, some of you have been asking uh, for me to share the charts simultaneously visually, and although I haven't hacked that on Instagram yet, I am very close to being able to use the screen share feature on Facebook uh, and a a webcam implant in order to share the charts visually with you as I read them so that you can see them in, in real time. So that's soon to be a thing on Facebook. I'm still I'm still working on hacking Instagram. Uh, so if anybody's more tech savvy than me and wants to teach me how to screen share stuff, let me know. But uh, we are here for the Astro Babble. We have eight charts that have been donated by you, the lovely followers, and we're going to basically just read them cold, talk about astrology shit, and uh, if you'd like to learn more, learn astrology, book a consult, you can always go to my website, ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. But let's pop open a fizzy water and get to the, the chart dynamics, shall we? Okay. So first we have Allison. So Allison was born at 12.36 p.m. in St. Petersburg. Uh, let's take a peek at Allison's chart. We have a lovely Jupiter in Taurus with an ascendant in Taurus. Uh, very calm, collected, uh, stable nature right off the bat. Jupiter, Jupiter in Taurus is fun. Like Jupiter tends to make things big whenever whenever Jupiter touches the, uh, the, the first house or the ascendant. Uh, there tends to be issues with physical size differences, like growing a little bit too fast, but specifically because Jupiter is in Taurus, we want to be very aware from a medical perspective that metabolism issues um, are going to be part of the, the medical dynamic here. Jupiter being in the first house does give a grandioseness to the personality. So although Taurus is typically a very grounded sign, you know, this bull is double the size is a, is a good way to think of it with, with Jupiter and Taurus in the first house of self. Ruler of the chart is a, an amazing Venus in Pisces. Uh, so Venus is exalted in Pisces. She's in her favorite sign. Um, and she is up in the 11th house of friendships. I love to see a ruler of a chart in the 11th house because it, it really means that this person is personable. Um, it means that she's very sociable. She's um, very very able to sway the masses, especially having a Venus ruled chart, Venus goddess of love and abundance, uh, but also the idea of Venus and Pisces being exalted and in a friendship position, this just doubles, triples, quadruples down on the charisma, especially having Jupiter, uh, the greater benefic, and Venus, the lesser benefic, in such prominent chart placements. I think that this is absolutely massively wonderful stuff for Allison. I think it's a great way to kick off the chart. We do have an interesting dynamic with a new moon uh, in Aquarius in Allison's chart. Both her sun and her moon are in Aquarius, meaning at the time that she was born, she was born during a new moon just after the conjunction of the moon and the sun. Having having those placements, having a double whatever, uh, having, you know, ascendant and sun, moon and sun, uh, moon and ascendant, having two planets or two primary personality markers in the same sign gives us a double dose of that sign. But especially what's, what's really interesting about this pairing is we've already talked about how sociable um, this chart is because the ruler of the chart is in the 11th house of friendships, tribes, communities, that kind of stuff. But having the sun and the moon in Aquarius in the 10th gives us a, a social isolation principle. Actually, Aquarius is one of those signs that tends to push away, that tends to distance, that tends to um, prefer to be up in their lofty towel, tower doing scientific experiments and not necessarily interact with the rabble, the human uh, element of existence, although the highest expression of that Aquarius is the Prometheus archetype, um, the the divine being who brings fire down to down to humanity via inspiration. And I think to have the moon and the sun in the tenth, there is going to be a large flavor of that Prometheus myth in the chart, especially using that natural charisma that Allison has in order to become um, somebody who is not just very well liked, but somebody who is very well respected. Um, when we look at Saturn, Saturn and Libra at 29 degrees, making a trying to... I'm... Okay, so I'm going to make a jump, and I'm going to say something 
specifically that I think would be appropriate. Um, this is a great show business chart. Like this is a great chart for fame. This is a great chart for um, a celebrity because we have natural celebrity markers in the chart via Venus, who is just very pleasing aesthetically, being in the 11th house of social groups, but then the moon and the sun are in the 10th house of success. And then that uh, that Saturn, which is ruling the moon and the sun, is being ruled by uh, Venus. Saturn is also in Libra, the sign of his exaltation, making a trine to Neptune and Aquarius on the 10th. This is, these are excellent markers for fame. These are excellent markers for somebody who's able to be in the public eye, withstand that public eye, and also do good in the public eye, which I think is a rare combination, and Allison has that um, in spades, really. The issue is going to come into this ninth house, though. Um, and to a certain degree, the north and south note. Oh, money. That's going to be a thing. Ooh, yeah. Friends who are just in it for the money. That's not okay. This uh, this Venus in Pisces is being squared by the nodes, um, as well as we have this... Uh, we have this this Mercury in, in Capricorn and Pluto in Capricorn up in the ninth house of uh, travel, foreigners, higher education, spirituality. I think that there's a natural skepticism to the chart, and that should be present, um, a stubbornness to the mind because of that Capricorn energy in Mercury. Um, but I think, and I think that that's appropriate because, and I even think that the Aquarius sun and the moon, like the ability to emotionally distance and become apathetic, also very appropriate in this chart because we have... Um, a person who needs that, who needs that distance, who needs that stubbornness, who needs to be skeptical um, and not just take things at face value and, and be a pushover. But that north node, south node squaring the ruler of the chart, I think that there is a big, a big issue when it comes to playing safe with money versus investing money um, and potentially going into business for oneself. I think that there's a lot of good to be done in the chart, but I also think that especially with with the people that are surrounding this chart, there there's a little bit more of an opportunity for scavengers um, and for people to take advantage of this chart. That's not that Allison would be taken advantage of because there's there's just so much in the chart that that is self-sufficient is a good way to say it, um, and naturally skeptical of, of wolves prowling the, the property of, of the chart. But that Saturn, that Saturn making an exact trine at 29 degrees to Neptune via the 6th and the 10th, I think that there's just so much popularity chemistry here that I, I can't wait to see what this chart grows into. There's just so many amazing things that... Um, that I would really like to see unfold. If we're able to get some of the apathy under control, if we're able to get, you know, some of the the loose, fast and loose friendships under control, you know, if we're able to understand the, the true purpose of money, all these things in Allison's chart that I think will will reveal themselves overall just a really solid and very uh, influential chart. Fabulous. Um, good morning, everybody jumping on. Thank you so much for, for joining me this morning. We are on chart number two. Let's talk about Bryant. Um, so Bryant was born at uh, 7.48 p.m. in Boise. Let's take a peek at, at Bryant's chart. So we have a Cancer Ascendant. Where's the moon? The moon who's ruling the chart is in Leo in the second house of finance. Um, so that immediately when we see the ruler of the chart in the financial house, money is going to be extremely, extremely important to this person. Um, the idea of time scheduling um, as well as uh, energy, the, the, the distribution of not just physical wealth, but also non-physical versions of wealth like um, one's energy and time is going to be very, very important. A um, little bit of a drama queen, not going to lie. That moon in Leo is a little bit of a flamboyant placement, especially when ruling the chart. Although it is a, it is a, um, a moon that is only 75% uh, full and on the waxing phase, or uh, waning phase rather. So she is, she is not as strong as, as she could be. Let's take a peek. What else? What else? We have three planets in, in Sag, three planets in Scorpio, Sun is in Scorpio, Pluto in Scorpio, Mercury in Scorpio, and then Uranus, Saturn, and Venus in Sag. 
that's a pretty interesting dynamic in the chart, putting so much in the fifth house of parents, children, creativity, sexuality, then putting so much in the sixth house of work, health, pets. We have we have some, some pileups happening uh, in the chart, but none of them are really as interesting as I'd like them to be. Um, you know, having having a Sun in Scorpio in the fifth, also having Mercury and Pluto in Scorpio in the fifth, does give us somebody who tends to be very mysterious. Uh, having a water sign on the Ascendant just doubles down when we have uh, that watery sun as well. Fiery Moon is, uh, is also in semi-reception because it's being ruled by the sun through its placement in Leo. So I think we have we have more of a watery dynamic for sure in this chart. Somebody who uh, loves loves a good secret, um, as Scorpio is prone to do, but also somebody who tends to get rather um, evil geniusy with their creativity. That Mercury in Scorpio is known to concoct uh, uh, quite quite a few plans. Um, but also the idea of having so many prominent Scorpio placements in a fifth house that is known for sexuality. We need to understand, embrace, and work with. Um, a lot of the kinks, a lot of the sexual expression that's naturally prominent in this chart, um, and make sure that that is not repressed in any way, shape, or form, especially because Pluto tends to, to shove things down and make them a little bit more poisonous for the first half of the life. We need to access those and kind of bring them out a little bit. Let's see, all of this sad stuff being ruled by this Jupiter and Aries retrograde in the 10th. Um, there's this end the north notice here in Aries in the tenth. I think, I think the idea of success is very, is very um, attachment oriented in this chart. It doesn't come natural like the previous chart. Um, having a retrograde planet in the tenth, especially Jupiter, who's ruling the sixth house of work. Um, there's an underlying resentment to success. There's the idea of, you know, all I do is work, 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 and I never get anywhere for it. And even when I do get honored for it, I resent it because of the work that I put in doesn't match the, uh, the, the level of success that I wish I would receive and the recognition that I wish I would receive um, for that. Interestingly, the ruler of the 10th is uh, Mars in Libra in the 4th. So there is uh, there are multiple family dynamics in this chart that are not necessarily great for fostering that success. And I think one of the things that Bryant might actually need to do is uh, uproot some of those seeds that were planted in regards to success, achievement, work, because the, the seeds that were planted in the family life growing up early in those topics of success and career are slightly misguided and toxic. Mars is in uh, his fall in Libra. He does not like to be in Libra. And to have that Mars in Libra in the fourth house of family um, ruling this Jupiter and Aries retrograde in the 10th, I think that we need to, we need to uh, uproot some of, those, some of those misconceptions about what it means to be successful in life. Because it's not about the status, right? And sometimes it's about just doing an honest day's work. But if you keep trying to attach yourself to this idea of success um, because you have to live up to this invisible standard that you've carved out for yourself, like that's not that's not helpful. Um, I would much rather see you um, work with investments, Brian. I would rather see you tinker with money. I would rather see you um, manage your own wealth instead of trying to achieve other people's wealth and that's that's a that's a really important concept especially because you like to play in the shadows so much you know you often don't have time to be that that ideal entrepreneurs with entrepreneur with the six ferraris and the online evergreen courses and blah 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 like who cares who cares if you're not happy brian and that's something that uh, I think you'll learn over time if you have not started to learn that already. So first priority is definitely uprooting some of those uh, family planted ideas of success um, and also uh, working into some of that fifth house deeper Scorpio energy for sure. Okie dokie. So we are on chart number three, just moving right along. Uh, so we have uh, Bodhi Kai, uh, who was born at 10, 18 a.m. in Sarasota. Let's take a peek at this chart. So we have a Gemini Ascendant, 
uh, with a Mercury retrograde in Aries ruling the chart. Interesting, interesting decision. Um, south node also in Gemini in the first house. Uh, sun in Aries, which is exalted in the 11th, along with Jupiter and Uranus. Um, so we have some personality difficulties in the chart right off the bat. Um, and we have some fire-water conflict in the chart right off the bat. So when we have Mercury as the ruler of the chart, yeah, and Mercury is retrograde, or the chart ruler is retrograde, that immediately tells us that the personality is quirky, backwards, um, and just a little bit out of control. Um, there are going to be levels of this person's personality uh, that are that are ambiguous and really difficult to understand uh, because we have that Mercury ruling the chart, but the Mercury is retrograde going backwards, plus the south node here in the first house. You know, that south node is the energy suck of the chart. It's where we've been. It's, it's our old lessons that we've mastered, and to see that south node um, in the first house it, it really does not bode well for personality development as a whole. Um, so in early life specifically, as, as Bodhi starts to really investigate what it means to have an exalted son in the 11th house of friendships, um, a very strong, very fiery, very passionate son in the 11th house of friendships, um, there's also this this counterbalance of feeling extremely insecure, very backwards, always a part of the group, but never a part of the group. It's black sheep mentality uh, when we look at the just the idea of all of these social placements in the 11th house of friendships, including the chart ruler, but like Jupiter's combust the sun, Mercury is retrograde, south nodes in, south nodes in the first, like everything that we would see like in the first chart that was very that was very helpful for the social dynamic even uranus which is the planet of unpredictability in the 11th house like we have all of these markers that are more difficult to channel personality wise and although this is a chart that can also be very charismatic because the sun is in in aries in the 11th house of friendships it's it's very very good for sociability um that sociability can also come across as domineering, as showboating, as hogging of attention, um, as overly dramatic, as as Bodhi starts to learn how to control the fire within. Um, it's going to be a lifelong process of learning how to channel the heat from that sun in Aries and that misdirected chart ruler. But I think we have even more of an interesting combination in this chart because we have Venus in Pisces, this, the Moon in Pisces, as well as Mars in Pisces in the 10th house of success. Now, having Venus in, in Pisces in the 10th house of success is excellent, um, especially for creative endeavors, especially for things like art. We also have Saturn in Libra in the 5th house of creativity, so I would highly, highly recommend studying art uh, for Bodhi. Art would be art and creative expression, definitely something that Bodhi should be in. Fashion also to a certain degree. Um, but anything that anything or or spirituality, um, but I really think art art would be where it's at. Um, even spiritual art. Because Pisces is that is that natural sign that gravitates towards the finding the divine in the human, and there's no better way to find the divine in, the, in that human experience than artistic expression. However, having both Venus and Mars here, as well as the moon, you know, we have a lot of really interesting dynamics of gender dysmorphia, gender identity politics with both Venus and Mars, that masculine feminine sign in the 10th house of success, but also, um, a moon in Pisces, you know, the, the emotional needs of the chart being so success and attention oriented, I think that's where some of the showboating comes in, especially. Uh, but the flip side to that is Pisces, Pisces being the mutable water sign of the zodiac is naturally not great at boundaries. Um, a Pisces moon is extremely sensitive. In fact, I would argue it's one of the most sensitive um, placements that can happen in any chart. Um, it is the wateriest of water, um, Pisces is. It's not frigid like Scorpio or pointed like Scorpio. It's not caring and compassionate and 
in some ways overly empathetic, like Cancer. Um, Pisces is just that jellyfish that's kind of bobbing along in the cosmic ocean, picking up the flotsam and jetsam as it as it kind of bobs. And to have that in the 10th house of success, such a prominent placement, I think it does make this person extremely sensitive. And also being able to work with sensitive mediums. But at the same time, I think personality development-wise, it clashes with some of the fire that we see in the chart. How can somebody be so exalted from a fire perspective, but also so watery and deep and sensitive um, at the same time? That's going to be very difficult to balance throughout the life. But I think working in a field like art, working in a field that allows creative expression, but also allows personal development through the work, you know, that's going to be an ideal place uh, to put this individual. Because we have the North Node in the seventh house, one of the major priorities of this chart and of this person is going to be to find a relationship um, and is going to be relationship development, period. Uh, I think that having Jupiter and Aries combust the Sun in the 11th makes relationships inherently difficult in this chart. Um, however, this, this doesn't mean that relationships shouldn't happen, and it doesn't mean that uh, relationships should come naturally. In fact, one of the major lessons that I think even, even studying something like art would, would bring forward is how to relate to people, often in a non-verbal way, because with that Mercury retrograde ruling the chart, words fall flat a lot of the times, and they often tend to confuse more than they shed light. Uh, whenever we have Mercury retrograde in the chart, you know, it's, it's communication issues. Um, but to have that ruling the chart, often finding an unspoken language to communicate feelings, to build a relationship, art does that. Um, and I think building relationships in non-conventional ways is something that this chart exceeds in um, and needing to needing to maneuver these same relationships di relationship dynamics that other people would find easy uh, is actually the difficulty of this chart not not even taking into account how sensitive this person is but also how much they need attention um, the, the combination of the two makes it inherently difficult to balance uh, a stable relationship. So we need to work in that space a lot more. And I think working in a career that's very relationship driven will help to pound out some of those, some of those inconsistencies. Excellent. Perfect. Uh, so we are on chart number four. So chart number four is Taylor. Hey, Taylor. How you doing? Uh, 347 p.m. in Hickory. Let's take a peek. So we've got Aquarius Ascendant, Saturn in the 11th. The 11th house is the theme today. Weird. Um, so to have the chart ruler in the 11th house for the, for the billionth time this morning, make somebody naturally charismatic, very personal, uh, very uh, good with crowds. Um, but also somebody who strives to to bond friendship wise with with everybody that they meet. So that's that's uh, first thing that we need to understand about having Saturn in in Sag. Um, but we do have Saturn and Uranus conjunct at 27 degrees exactly in the 11th house. That that brings some interesting friendship dynamics, Taylor. I'm not sure I'm a fan of that. You know, because Saturn is that planet of restriction and uh, control and hyper-focus. And Uranus is that planet of unpredictability and uh, lack of control and natural disasters and things that sneak up on us. And to have both of those conjunct uh, in the 11th house of friendships and social groups, you know, social activism might be a passion for you, but we also need to understand, like, it doesn't necessarily make you stable. Um, in fact, it can also do the opposite. It can destabilize um, just as much as it fulfills you. So that's, that's, a, uh, that's a doozy right off the bat. Um, we do have this moon in Capricorn in the 12th house. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing all of this. You're, you're so serious, Taylor. So serious. Why so serious? Um, and you're just such a social justice warrior. Get over yourself, the sun and sun and Libra in the ninth. Can't with you, Taylor. Just 
bleeding heart all throughout. But what I like what I like about your chart, Taylor, is you know you really you really draw multiple lines in the sand, and you really follow the rules, but also respect that the rules are meant to be broken. Um, and with all of this in your chart, to have the sun in Libra that basically, you know, anybody who has sun in Libra, the, the word that best summarizes their life is fair. Um, they're always seeking for fairness uh, to, be, to be super present. And so with, with your chart and your Capricorn moon and your Saturn ruling the chart, uh, I think that it's this idea of you breaking the mold um, and you specifically looking for fairness in all the wrong places um, and learning how unfair and unjust the world really is, but also doing something about it. Uh, how about that? Uh, specifically from a writing perspective, um, it seems like your, your Mars and Aries, which is retrograde in the third house, just right on the cusp at zero degrees Aries too, um, ruling this Pluto and Scorpio in the 10th, it, it might not feel this way now, especially because you have this Mercury and Libra retrograde in the ninth, um, which does give some learning learning issues and some writing communication and speech issues. Um, but I think overall, one of the things that you should be striving towards is learning how to share your message with the world via writing, teaching, and speaking. If you have not considered that, you definitely should. Um, and I know that there's confidence issues and there's uh, you specifically repressing your emotions and other other things with this moon in the 12th that, that need to be coughed up. Um, goodness, even this repressed Venus in, in Virgo. So many, like, and this is what I meant when I said so serious. Why so serious, Taylor? Um, you know, life, life contrary to what I think you believe is supposed to be easy. Imagine that for two seconds. Um, and yes, there are injustices. And yes, there is unfairness. And you specifically are uniquely qualified to dismantle these unfairnesses and these injustices. And I would highly, highly recommend that you that you work in a healing, a teaching, a speaking profession that allows you to address social constructs and, and unpack that that uh, disproportionate fairness and those injustices based on what we're seeing in your chart. But but I think we need to also remember that prioritizing your own happiness, Taylor, is a big part of your chart as well. You know, this this Jupiter in Gemini in the fifth house of creativity, ruling your north node in the second house of, of finance and, and personal energies. I think there's a there's a need for you to remember that although you are working in the world and working to make this world a better place. You know, there is also the need for you to take a break, uh, to soften, to remind yourself that there is a there is a plan in place. You know, even when it seems like you're taking one step forward, two steps back, uh, the idea of your chart, Taylor, specifically having having this desire to take so many steps forward at a given time and then getting so frustrated when you get smacked down by the universe, you know, you are not the sole agent of change. Um, there, there is that plan in place, which I think as you mature and as you've hit your first Saturn return, that's become a lot easier for you and more palatable for you to, to understand. But putting, putting Pluto and Scorpio in the 10th, ruled by Mars in Aries in the 3rd, really does give you this advantage halfway through the life once you realize how, how much power you actually have and how much you've held yourself back um, to, to really do some great work and, and age like fine wine uh, as, your, as your chart matures and as you start to understand the unique balance of your personal suppression with your personal expression. Good way to think about it. But definitely something we can go into more one-on-one -on -one should you feel that uh, so-called. I'm getting lots of messages. Thank you so much. I will respond to them uh, afterwards. 
However, we are halfway through. Uh, we've done four. We've got four more to go. Just a reminder, if you would like to be a part of the live stream, if you would like to have your chart featured, just send uh, via private message your birth date, place, and exact birth time, uh, and I will add you to the list. The list is very long. We did an all call last week, and I got over 150 active charts on this list. I do eight every uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so I am chipping away, but please be patient. Um, and if you'd like to work one-on-one -on -one in the meantime, or maybe learn some astrology, you can always go to ScorpioRisingAstrology.com, which is my website. Okay, we're on to chart number five. We have Jason. Jason, my man. We've got 10.32 p.m. in Washington. And we've got, uh, do, 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 we've got a Capricorn Ascendant with Saturn and Mercury conjunct in Taurus in the fifth. That's interesting. That's interesting. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, Jason, so let's talk about children. So to have your chart ruler in the fifth house, the fifth house is the house that naturally rules creativity, sexuality, but also more physical manifestations of that creative force like children um, and parenting. And to put your chart ruler in the fifth immediately identifies you with the archetype of the parent. Um, you, putting, you putting Saturn in Taurus is also really interesting because this is... This is one of the heaviest Earth placements that you could possibly have ruling your chart. Uh, Saturn in the fixed Earth sign of Taurus, paired with Mercury in Taurus in the fifth, really does give you this extremely earthy energy, this very stubborn mentality, this very headstrong ability to be both lazy and easygoing, but also extremely strict and very correct and very rule-abiding um, and always right, frankly. Um, but then we can we contrast it with this this sun in Gemini in the sixth, where you also have and and this uh, moon in in Libra in the second this air energy that's that's perfect to counterbalance the Earth in your chart. Where you know there are moments where you really just want to lose your shit and just blah, all over the place, and that's perfectly fine. Um, if people can't keep up with those two sides of your personality, then they don't deserve to be in your life. Uh, my two cents. So there is this Earth-Air kind of quality to your chart that I think is interesting. Although Saturn is ruling that moon in the second uh, in Aquarius, which, which I do enjoy. Um, I like it when the ruler of the chart rules the moon because it does give you this, this idea of, you know, you understand all of these earthy concepts, Jason. You understand the, the importance of time, the importance of ritual, the importance of money, the importance of of rules um, and to take all of those fundamental life concepts and like the idea of insurance like you get that it's it's in your blood basically um, and to have that channeled into the fifth house of children and parenting uh, where you can really foster the next generation and teach them how to be how to be appropriate adults um, is is I think very admirable and you've you've chosen that that very uh, intently and very well. What else do we see in the chart? We do have Venus and Cancer in the seventh, which I'm a fan of. So we have we have Venus and Cancer in the seventh, and this is this is, you know, this is somebody who you as a person, but also who you're attracted to. You know, when it comes to love in in your chart, Venus and Cancer is that octomom archetype, like. When you hold somebody, yeah, you you cannot squeeze them tight enough in order to feel connected uh, enough to them. There's there's this idea of when I when I see and have had relationships even with people with a Venus Cancer ruling the seventh, um, the idea of 
like they they want to burrow inside um like it doesn't matter how close how cuddly they get like they always want more and venus and cancer is that very um that very mothering archetype in that venusian love oriented sign it's it's definitely putting the the mother and smother uh from a from a relationship perspective but you enjoy that you know you enjoy somebody who uh, is kind of waiting on waiting for your attention waiting on every whim you know somebody who is going to be rather um who's going to be very affectionate very touchy-feely you you enjoy that um although it is contra to your personal nature and it can be kind of difficult for you to reciprocate that but i think putting your chart ruler in the fifth of sexuality hey that's that's not going to be a problem um very much especially with venus ruling that uh that house so love love that's that's great um the idea of the moon uh, being connected to that Venus in Cancer as well. In the seventh, you know, one of the things that you'll find in relationships is that money is extremely important. Um, and often your finances with your relationships are intimately connected, um, more so than you will often find comfortable. Uh, there is the possibility of marrying into money or being married to for money. Uh, but money being a central theme in the relationship, you know, I'm reminded of that Susie Osmond quote where she says you should be naked with somebody financially before you're naked with them physically and i think that 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 definitely applies to your chart what else do we see well that's interesting we have that same relationship between the third house of writing teaching communication and the tenth house of success um I would highly recommend, Jason, that you that you investigate at some point in your life the writing, teaching, speaking space. Um, I think that the partner that you choose will also have a an air of fame to them, um, just because Venus uh, from the seventh is ruling the tenth. So finding a partner who is actually just a little bit famous, um, and you potentially writing about that experience, or them introducing you to the idea of writing, teaching, communication, and being supportive of that work, because that's where your chart is going with a North Node in Pisces in the third okay that's it thank you Jason I appreciate you donating your chart to the live stream very very much um, let's go ahead and move on to our next chart we have crystal so crystal was born at uh, 1 a.m. in South Williamson South Williamson uh, so we have a Capricorn ascendant in this chart where is Saturn? Saturn is in Cancer, conjoined... Ooh. Saturn is in Cancer, conjoined Mars in Cancer in the 7th. Ooh. That's rough, buddy. That's rough. I'm, I'm so interested in your chart, Crystal, for a couple reasons. Two reasons, specifically. My dear, my darling. Um, because we have Saturn, the chart ruler, in Cancer, opposing his natural sign of Capricorn technically in his fall... And then we have Mars conjoin that Saturn, also in Cancer, in the sign of his fall. I mean, relationships are really tricky for you, honey. But it's something that you crave, you over-identify with the relationships. Um, and simultaneously putting both malefic planets in conjunction in your seventh house. Like, very strange very strange we might need to work with that with some remediation techniques um but this idea of hot and cold being uh something that you'll find a lot in relationships you know saturn and mars are both dry planets energetically but to put them in the loving sign of cancer it's this idea of using emotions as uh using emotions inappropriately as blackmail or leverage, uh, but also having partners who are hot, cold, hot, cold, very affectionate, not affectionate, very affectionate, not affectionate, but only when they want something. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of part of the, the dynamic there, which I'm, I'm very interested to hear kind of what what your thoughts are on the relationship perspective, having, having such a tricky, 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 tricky uh, setup there. But we do have multiple placements that I think are beautiful and exalted in the chart. First and foremost, having a sun in Taurus and a moon in Taurus, which is the sign of her exaltation, in the fifth house of parents and children. Um, I think that this is lovely. I think that one of your saving graces will be children, should you choose to have them. I think that it will bring you a lot of emotional fulfillment, egoic fulfillment. The idea that, you know, children touch a 
touch a piece in your heart that very few other topics in life can. And I think that that's that's a really beautiful thing for you to for you to investigate and potentially even work in that space as well with uh, with children and parenting. We also have Jupiter in Pisces and Venus in Pisces. So Jupiter is in Pisces, which is his home sign, great. And Venus in Pisces, which is the sign of her exaltation. You've put both of the benefics in the third house of writing, teaching, communication. So I think like where you where relationships might be extremely difficult, your creative endeavors are off the charts, honey absolutely off the charts. I would highly encourage you to make an Etsy account. You're just so creative um, with that with that uh, Sun and Taurus ruling the 8th house of business. I love to see that. Um, also, with Venus and Pisces ruling your 10th house of success, I think that success will come later in life because Pluto is here and Uranus is here um, and they're both retrograde. But I think with Having Jupiter and Venus in the third house is the mark of a writer, it's the mark of a teacher, it's the mark of a speaker, somebody who has a lot to say, and what they have to say is extremely valuable and very, very just good. Yeah? I like it. I like it a lot. Um, so whereas the relationships might not necessarily be a strong point in life, the idea of the fifth house of children and the third house of writing, teaching, communication being so packed with great stuff, I really like it. I really, really like it. Um, and I would highly encourage you to maybe work in, in uh, children's illustration. Children's books would be an excellent uh, kind of thing for you to uncover and discover. Uh, but just, I can't get over how you've chosen to just dump crap in the seventh house of relationships and save all of the good stuff. It's it's So I'm a, I'm a very picky eater, and I know some of you will... Um, uh, empathize with this, but the idea that you save certain portions of your meal for like the perfect bite and you sacrifice other bites in the meal so that they're not as good because you're saving like the perfect bites for the end, like that's very much what you've done with your chart. You've decided, okay, relationships, meh, I don't really need those to survive. So I'm going to put, I'm going to put the sour stuff, the bitter stuff in the seventh house of relationships, but then I'm going to leave all of the great stuff for these two areas of life that I absolutely adore, the fifth house of, of children, friendships, or uh, children, parenting, um, sexuality, creativity, and then the third house of writing, teaching, communication. Those, those are your power places, Crystal. So play in those areas, and you'll find a large portion of your life fulfilled. Oh, girl, and you've published a children's book. I can't with you. I can't with you. I love it. Yes, relationships have been hard. Love you so much, Crystal. Thank you so much for that that affirmation. Um, yes, I hope that you've. I hope that you enjoyed the little little tidbit. Uh, okay, so let's talk about Ruby, our seventh chart in the lineup. Um, Ruby was born at 1:21 a.m. in Piedras. I think I'm saying that right. Piedras Negras. Uh, let's take a peek. Ooh, stellium and stellium and Libra in the second house. That's fun. With Venus and Libra in her home sign, and Saturn and Libra in exaltation. What? What? Ruby, you throw me for a loop, child. You throw me for a loop. Okay. So we've got this Virgo Ascendant, right? Anybody with a Virgo Ascendant or ma major Virgo placements are going to align with these phrases. Organization, cleanliness, picky as hell. Um, and to have that to have that as the Ascendant, you know, it's a it's a pretty surefire, surefire thing. What in a grand earth a uh, grand air train? Ruby. Ruby, your chart. Get out of town. We're we're gonna have fun with you. So to have the ruler of the chart, this Mercury in Scorpio, in the third house of writing, teaching, communication, as well as having the Sun in Scorpio here, and Uranus in Scorpio here, really does give us, again, the writing, teaching, communication bit coming forward, having the ruler of the chart here, but also Scorpio uh, being infiltrating this area of the chart. You know, Ruby likes to write about and teach about and talk about things that are dark, things that are mysterious, things that are occulty, things that are um, rather sensual and intimate, and the dark places that other people don't like to tread. You know, Ruby really enjoys those spaces, um, and her mind naturally gravitates towards writing, speaking, teaching about those topics. 
to have, and, and now that we've talked about that, we need to address this grand air trine. So we have in the chart a Libra stellium. So Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Pluto, all in Libra in the second house of finance. So finance is going to be a major topic for Ruby. However, finance is great, absolutely great to have two planets um, in their rulership and both benefics, one of them being Venus in her home sign of Libra, ruling Saturn in his exaltation. That's how you deal with Saturn. You put him in his exaltation and you put him co-present with Venus ruling him in her home sign, in the second of finance, which Saturn naturally adores. Like, great, great financial stuff, Ruby. I love it. I absolutely love it for you. But what's interesting about Ruby's chart is that she's then put this Jupiter at three degrees and this Saturn at six degrees in trine to her five degree Aquarius sun in the sixth house of work, which is then making a trine to the MC, the midheaven in Gemini at five degrees. I'm very much a fan of her working in finance. Um, I'm very much a fan of her working with money. I'm very much a fan of her um, taking all of this strength that she has in the second house of money, time, um, and energy, and really applying it towards work and applying it towards success. I think that it's, it's just so good. And I would specifically like her to write about her financial topics. I'd like her to teach other people what she knows about how to manage money um, and how to work with financial resources um, and specifically how to be apathetic about it. You know, that's one of the things that a moon in Aquarius, it's a tricky skill to master. Just like a moon in Cancer or a moon in Pisces or a moon in Scorpio is a tricky skill to master, having, having a moon in Aquarius naturally sucks all of the water out of the moon, whereas having the moon in a water sign puts all of an excess of water into the moon. Yeah, but having a moon in Aquarius, especially trying to Saturn, who is exalted, oh, I love your chart, Ruby, it's so tasty. Um, having this moon in Aquarius in the sixth gives us this idea of apathy being a natural skill that Ruby has and something that she employs regularly in her workspace. You know, numbers don't lie. Is, is kind of the, <laughs> that is the statement of Ruby's chart. Numbers don't lie, yeah? Everything is black and white. Everything on paper, like at the end of the day, you plug the numbers into a spreadsheet, into Excel, and it pumps out either uh, a black number and you're above board, or a red number and you're, you're, uh, you're losing money, you're bleeding resources, and that's, that's the language that Ruby deals with on a regular basis. And it's a very non-emotional language. It's a very, this is the way that it is. I'm sorry, um, but I'm not sorry. Like, you, you, you abuse the numbers, and so they're abusing you. Like, it's, it's a thing. And I think with all of this Scorpio energy in her third house of writing, teaching, communication, Ruby is uniquely qualified to walk people through some of this, uh, some of this really detrimental, um, some of this really detrimental financial stuff that a lot of people get hung up on that she's just decided that she's going to be a boss with. Uh, and I think that that's really, really glorious to have such a packed second house with, again, Venus and Libra in her rulership. Uh, ruling Saturn in Libra via exaltation, having Jupiter here, and then Pluto, which is just going to mature like uh, really, really well. As she hits 50, she's really going to access a second layer of power. And then the grand Earth trine, or uh, air trine to bring it all together with uh, Jupiter, Saturn, trining the moon in Aquarius, trining the, the midheaven in Gemini. Just absolutely flawless, absolutely fabulous. I do think Ruby. One of the things that, uh, if I had to, if I had to say, any any areas of improvement that you could make, any constructive criticism, because I know you're a fan of constructive criticism, yeah, because um, you're just always trying to be more efficient. Uh, we do have this South Node in in Aquarius in the sixth, um, and I think that one of the things that you probably need to be a little bit better at is delegating, because although you are very good at what you do. Sometimes it's not about you doing the work. Sometimes it is about uh, training somebody else, specifically, again, back to that writing, teaching, communication component. 
Yeah, writing a manual about how to do what you do and then having other people work for you in that environment uh, in order to do it so that you can work from home and kind of do your own thing. Um, you setting up that training experience and teaching other people so that you don't necessarily need to be doing the grunt work of the day-to-day -day stuff. Like that's the higher elevation of your chart that I think is a little bit more important for, for you to understand and work with. Um, because you already have, like, you've decided to come in with these bomb skills, absolutely, massively valuable skills. But the hard part of the work is going to be trying to transfer those skills to other people, uh, because we all know that you can do the work. You're a freaking stu- you're, you're a superstar. Yeah? We get it. We get it, Ruby. You're amazing. But... From this perspective, we need to understand how to pass those skills on to the next generation to make sure that you are not kind of, in some ways, hoarding your skills, yeah? Because it's a lot easier for you to walk into a room and say, here, let me do it, yeah? But the karma of your chart is about teaching other people to do it for themselves. Excellent. Okie dokie. Uh, cool. So we are going into our final chart of the morning. Uh, let's go ahead and take a peek at Florence's chart. So Florence was born at 10.20 p.m. in Providence. Let's take a peek. Uh, so we have an Aquarius Ascendant with Saturn and Aquarius... Um, I'm sorry. A Sagittarius Ascendant with Saturn in Sagittarius retrograde in the first, as well as Uranus and Sag retrograde in the first. This is, um, this is tricky, tricky, personality-wise. This also, from a medical astrology perspective, we find that Sagittarius rules the liver and the hips. So to have Uranus, the planet of unpredictability, and Saturn, which tends to make things weak and feeble, both of those retrograde in the first house of the body, uh, we need to be very aware of the liver and very aware of the hips. And often those are the two areas of the body, um, especially with blood sugar, um, that will be the indicators of health in Florence's particular situation. So as the hips start to get creaky, as the energy level via blood sugar starts to crash, we need to respect that those are are the physical areas that need to be paid the most attention to. However, who is ruling the chart but this lovely, absolutely lovely Jupiter and Pisces in the fourth house of family? I'm a fan of that placement for sure. I love it. Um, having the ruler in the fourth house of family does make you very attached to that topic, Florence. So we have this this big part of your chart. You know, you're, you're a family gal at the end of the day. You know, family, home is where the heart is. That's, that's very much the, the essence of having the ruler of your chart in the fourth house. Um, so that's a thing. And to have a, have a solid Jupiter ruling the Ascendant, I think that that's, that's great. It, it does buffer some of those detrimental Uranus and Saturn energies that uh, can sometimes get in the way. Uh, having a sun in Taurus in the sixth does make you a little bit of a workaholic, my dear, um, because the ego, the self-esteem is very attached to what you do for a living, but Taurus is also one of the major workhorse signs uh, in the zodiac, constantly constantly plowing the field is a good way to say it. Uh, Taurus, Taurus gets into a routine. Um, it's okay, it's okay. Everything will be recorded, my dear. Don't don't worry about it. Um, and also, uh, because it's glitching on Instagram, apparently, um, the 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 recording is also on Facebook, so so don't worry about it. You will see it. The uh, yeah, so Taurus is that workhorse sign of the zodiac. So having that in the sixth house um, is really interesting. Also, we have this Venus in Gemini in the seventh house of relationships ruling the Sun in Taurus in the sixth. Wouldn't surprise me if you actually go into business uh, or find your spouse via your work. Um, and where exactly is your work? Um, it wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me as well if again you you worked with your spouse or went into business with your spouse. Uh, but also the idea of your. Um, yeah, because we have Sun in, Sun in Taurus in the 6th, ruled by Venus in Gemini in the 7th, who is then being ruled by uh, Mercury in Aries in the 5th house of, of children. Um, children is something that uh, you're actually striving towards this time around, whether they are your own or whether they are adopted. Um, 
also there's connection between your second house of finance and children, uh, which I think is interesting. Back to that Saturn. So fascinating, your chart, my dear. You've you've decided to play you've you've decided to play intricacy to your to your advantage. You've grounded your chart with this very strong uh, Jupiter and Pisces in the fourth house of family, but then you've decided to screw up your first house of self with all these uh, Uranus Saturn retrograde stuffs, and then to put the Sun and Venus and Mercury all in connection in uh, sixth house of work, seventh house of relationships, fifth house of children. Like you're you're really trying to get that work life balance this time around. I think is a good way to to understand your chart from this perspective. So as we look at as we look at you becoming a little bit more grounded, as we look at you this time around becoming a little bit more about not just finding comfort in the home, but turning the home into a space for business to flourish, you know, you taking those relationships and turning them into productivity. Um, and I know that this is weird, but like the idea of you going into business with your spouse, but then also roping your children into the family business because of that connection between um, Mars and Capricorn, Moon and Capricorn, and uh, the fifth house of uh, fifth house of children. So that second fifth house connection with money and children. Yeah, it's like you you want you want the home to be the center of your life, and so. Everybody who comes near you from a relationship perspective. Oh, I found me I found me a spouse. We're gonna go into business together. Oh, I got me some kids. We're gonna we're gonna go into into business together. I'm gonna keep you around me um, at all times because when I'm around my people in my home, in my fourth house of family, I feel safe. Um, however, there are different challenges to that, my dear. We also need to respect that, you know, eventually eventually kids are gonna wanna leave the nest. Maybe relationships don't work out. Yeah, um, that does not make you less of a person. That also doesn't make you any less stable. Uh, however, it will feel destabilizing should these things happen to you. We just need to respect that for you, the home life is the most important. So if we master, if we master the home, if we master both the physical space of the home and also the relationships that take place in the home, and in some ways you fight the urge to wrangle everybody into a singular activity um, because everybody has different definitions of what it means to be close yeah um, especially having the fifth house of children um, yeah I know you never want to leave your house darling I know um, <laughs> uh, especially having you know Mercury and Aries ruled by Mars and Capricorn uh, in in the child dynamic should you have children um, they're actually going to be very driven they're going to be very leadership oriented they're probably going to want to flee and gain independence and that's not going to work with your chart ruler at all um, and so we need to be we need to be fostering yeah we need to be respecting the idea of the home being the sanctuary in your chart but we also need to understand that like eventually people are going to need to leave your nest yeah and that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be soul crushing for you. But at the same time, it's going to be exactly what you need to understand. Like there needs to be a revolving door policy in the home, just as much as just as much as you find rooting and groundedness and pleasure uh, and and the ability to to work and to uh, find safety in the fourth house of family. There is this idea of you know you can't hold people close enough to to really get them on your level because they don't have your chart placements yeah their priorities are going to be different from you and that's part of that's part of navigating relationships period especially having venus and gemini you know having partners uh and relationships with multiple interests like sometimes they just want to go to the park or they want to play DD with their friends or they want to do you know other things that interest them like go fishing and you're like i would rather stay at home and you being able to say okay i respect that you're not leaving me because i'm inadequate you know you're leaving me because you need to go do other things and i'm going to be in my safe space in my home space and that's perfectly fine yeah, just because you need to kick your your daughters out of the nest does not mean that they hate you. It also does not mean that you're a terrible parent. It's it's inevitable. Um, we just need to understand that when in doubt, come back to the home. 
And if you feel like that space is empty, if you feel like it's cluttered, if you feel like it's not where you want it to be, then fix it, change it, bring in new characters, you know, have that revolving door policy of the home, but understand that that's where your chart is centered. And we really need to understand that dynamic before moving into other areas of the life. Okay, so master the foundation. And just about with that, we are at time. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining me for another round of the Astro Babble. Um, we've featured eight charts, and we will feature another eight charts on Friday morning, same time, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you would like to be a part of the live stream or people that you know, like, and trust would be like to be a part of the live stream, have them private message me, their birth date, place, and exact birth time, and I will add them to the list. The list is long, um, but I will get to everybody, and I will message you when your chart is featured. Uh, if you would like to work one-on-one -on -one with me personally, uh, just go to ScorpioRisingAstrology.com. That's my website. I have online classes to teach you astrology, as well as we can always book private consults. Um, I very, very much enjoy uh, these this time that we have together. Uh, but until next time, uh, may the stars be ever in your favor.